okay, let's make a start on the, the second part of this, which is about using this, digging into this global data set and then looking at particular uh, projections for island scale and what might be useful for different places. So um, go from going from these global to local waves and what kind of information do you use at different case study sites? I also want to show some of the, it's all in modeling so far, so I want to show some of the, the observations that were made um, for St. Vincent last, I don't know, two years ago, I think it was. And then some case studies and how finally how you can actually access this data, how you can get hands hands on the wave model data and, and these outputs yourselves to be able to make use of it. So I'm not sure if I've actually given you all these case studies, but we'll we'll go through a few of them, see how much time we've got. So a few of the wave impacts that we've talked about before about these um the road damage and erosion, sort of undermining of, of the infrastructure, as well as sand burying stuff when you've got this really mobile um mobile beach sediment that can overwash roads. Then we've got the, the impact on the sargassum and how this uh, how the beaching of seaweed can be a real real environmental problem, and, and more erosion events. So often on the on the east on the east coast on these windward coasts where you're getting these big swell waves that everything's exposed to. So kind of local. So Judith introduced this set of study sites before. Um, of, of I think 40, 40 odd islands and, and different different site, sites that are identified from the previous workshop. So the first thing you can do is go, go into that global model and pull out the sort of typical wave climate around and you know get these at a at a scale of you know, what does it look like around the coast of Jamaica? What does it look like around the coast of Trinidad Tobago? And then get an idea of that that kind of wave climate typically rather than just look at the whole map. So one thing to say is that these are uh, these are from the global model so they still are showing quite a coarse representation of what it is rather than taking it down to the island scale so this is just pulling out the one point from your global model and it hasn't then done the the next step which is to translate that down into a sort of downscaled answer um, because these global models are quite coarse so they miss a lot of the detail so in some cases um the grid cell is like can be bigger than the island that you're trying to represent so you might not know that there's land there or not. Um, you might have the water depth wrong because you're missing the, the right sort of asymmetry. There's some, some structure, some reef, something that there that is, isn't represented well in the model. They're also going to be forced. So the wind, um, the wind forcing that we use to drive these models is also at a, a lower resolution. So your waves are only going to be as good as the wind forcing that you give to them. So if you've got sort of slow, sluggish storms that aren't really sharply represented in your wind model, you're not going to get such nice, nice results from your wave model. So this is all that these are all the reasons why we would want to use the downscaling to improve the local projections. Um, I had some examples uh, from, from different hurricanes, but one of the good things that you can use about interrogating these models is that you can have decades of data. So they've been hindcasts run into the past from um, sort of 30, 35 years plus now that you can dig into and you can look at these extreme events in the context of these climatologies if you like so you can look at a single hurricane and say well you know how how rare is this how much more damage do you get so than from the background wave conditions so if you look into these long model line casts look at a time series so you can see this is 30 37 years um, of significant wave height at the top and then, then the difference from the climatology so the, this is this is the mean state over here so throughout the year you get these these sort of double peaks during the the higher hurricane season that's the typical wave height wave, wave direction and if you just look at the, this is the path of hurricane ivan which shoots right right past Nisha. and you can see that how how rare this was compared to the background so this is sort of a um how much it diverts from the typical conditions so sort of seasonally in November, your hurricane, your your wave height would look, look like this, and then during the actual event, so the the peak waves are like twice as big as as what you would normally see that time of year. So the, these sort of long wave model data sets are useful for the extreme analysis, um, and these sort of yeah sort of fitting sort of the statistics to these rarity of these events. So that's something else that you can use the use the wave data sets for these long data sets. This is, I'm sorry, this is a UK picture, but I just had a something with a, a, a nasty coastline um, to show the, the difference between the kind of model skill and, and resolution you get from these global type models and down to the regional model. So in this case, I'm just showing the island and the, the west coast of the UK. 
the main things that yeah so the, the, the first, first of all is, is the box size the, size of the model grid is much improved but also you're missing detail about the the shape of the seabed and the, the, the bathymetry um so you, you'll say what what part is deep and then you might see these steep shelves and steep coastlines which are completely missed off in the in the course version in the global model you're also going to miss out the sheltering by islands so for example down here we've got the silly isles which are not actually represented in the model. So here, you wouldn't know there was an island there. In this case, they're represented by a sort of partial obstruction, so that some of the wave energy can get through in the model, but not, but it's not seen as a land point. So it's sort of blocking that wave energy. So by using this downscaling, we can get uh, more, you know, more more spatial detail in one box than you had before. You also get the position of the land and the shape of the coastline right, and you can also improve it by using a higher resolution wind forcing on top of those waves. So the better your say the better your wind forcing is, the better your wave model is going to be at the end of it. So that's the that's the approach to using the wave model. But as I said in the previous presentation, you still need to have that whole global picture to be able to drive the waves into your island scale. So if you want to use these sort of regional or island scale models, you have to embed them in the global model. So you might have a sort of nested approach where you take this global model get that big swell coming in and then you have this little local nest to get it right at your area as well as getting the wind right these models really rely on the skill of um, the bathymetry so you, uh, something we've missed again in previous workshops what's the what is the missing data better bathymetry that's what is, is so useful to constrain these models um so yeah again the, mod the quality of your wave model might be dependent on the quality of your bathymetry um, this was just to show the kind of the kind of resolution we get from this the, the global wave model so at the moment i've just plotted the the crosses are where where you're getting data out of the global model so you've sort of got 12 or so points which are covering the whole island so you are able to see differences at this scale so you can say which which is at the north coast which is slightly sheltered and this um, exposed area in um, in kingston harbour down here so you're getting sort of typically larger waves which are being more exposed to the south. But really, you're not going to be able to get a good picture like, like this kind of thing. So I say this is the global model. The resolution is about, well, it's, it's about half a degree in places and about 10 times that in, in the higher resolution. And again, this is sort of a, a half a degree-ish resolution model. So you really need to get that, uh, get a nested model to get the, the coastal representation right. Um, but we are able to still say things out of the global model. You're able to get a typical looking climatology. You can get the, the sort of normal normal wave directions. And um, in these case, the I should have said the mean line is in blue and the 90, I think it's 90, 95th percentile. So these are sort of the extreme waves in red. And you can get an idea of the seasonality of that typical wave climate. This is an example of the nested model that um, I think Judith might have presented before, but for St. Vincent, so this is where they've embedded one of these really fine nearshore models into the global data set. So this is just looking at the southwest coast of St. Vincent, sorry, southeast coast of St. Vincent, around the airport. And this is a high resolution swan model that's been nested in. So this is a shallow water model. And then you can see that, you know, these, what was a, a single box on our earlier map. So, yes, yeah, so we just had, just had the, the one point represented in our in our global wave model it has now come into you know really nice high resolution hundreds of meters scale and that was only possible because we had really nice bathymetry at that same place that we were able to combine these observations of high resolution bathymetry and the big global wave picture and um, able to able to get a nice map of the near shore waves altogether as well as having those wave models, um, you need to combine them with some observations. So there's no point, we've seen with the uh, previous observations that there's no point in having a, a, good, a good looking wave model if it hasn't been validated, if you haven't got the observations to confirm whether or not it's true, whether or not we're getting those, those extremes particularly right. So as part of this, the, the CME project that's winding up now, we had this uh, AWAC deployed off the uh, off the east coast of St Vincent within actually within that model box that I showed you earlier and from that we had observations of waves and currents which we can look at and can compare against our model 
So this is now some uh, model and observations to compare. This is a time series of the full time of the deployment. Uh, so the observations from that AWAC are in black and the model's in red. So I'm showing you wave, significant wave height here. And you can see, yeah, the model is broadly getting these all these events coming through. So typical wave heights of between one and two meters. And we're seeing that seeing the pattern well represented. But if you look at the, at the details where the model's not getting it right, so you're missing some of these larger peaks. So these high wave events of up to three, even four meters in places that are observed, the model isn't able to pick up. So this is the, I'm sorry, I haven't shown the two different examples, but this is the global model. So this is the coarse one, but I have, and I haven't got a slide showing it, but the, uh, yeah, the downscaling does improve the, the quality of the forecast. So this is just showing how well we can do with a, with a, with a global sort of impression, but the, the, the details that are being missed that you can see in the observations. So in a way it's combining these together. So you use the model to frame the observations know where to look, but then you always have to go back to that, that boy or instrument data to understand what your model's getting wrong and where you need to do the downscaling. Um, this is, so that was wave height. This is the mean direction. So very, very plain waves all coming in from the East Coast. Everything's pretty static. We're not quite sure what happened at the end of this, whether there was a, a change in position, change in the storminess. So that's something we need to go and look at and see what happened as they start to, to diverse part. And the same with the peak period. So the this is the this is the, again this is the, pe the period of the waves associated with those largest high energy waves. So again, the models representing it really well and getting a good look at everything. And then suddenly something happens. We're we're modeling something that isn't there or we're slightly in the wrong place. So it's these kind of comparisons with the model observations that um, lets you know where you need to improve your models, either with better data, better physics, better resolution. So I just want to do another couple of examples of where the waves might be important, which might then make you think, oh, I could use the wave data for this, or, or how about that? Um, so I've got a picture here. This is a picture from Trinidad of the different kind of mangroves where they might be at risk from various different natural hazards. So, I mean, certainly the rising sea levels will be affecting the mangroves because it affects that still water level at which they're living in that sort of environmental that band at which they can live. But there's the secondary effect of rising sea level, bringing that deep, deeper water and making the, the mangrove more exposed to these offshore waves. So if you just think extra sea level is deepening that water, more of that wave energy can come in and, and cause more erosion, cause more damage. And those larger waves then damage the vegetation, cause the coastal erosion. So the vegetation which was there acting as a really good sea defense has then become more vulnerable and it's all, it all sort of knocks on a bit. So that's one, one application, if you like, of, of the waves. Um, similarly with the seagrass, so all of these vegetation sort of act as quite a good coastal defence by removing the wave energy and dissipating all the, all the storms, but the more damage from other rivers, so if you remove them, if you've got some environmental damage, trawling can stop that wave breaking, so it actually makes the flooding worse, makes the erosion worse, and changes all that, all that natural sediment transport pathways. So there's those sort of, you might not think are directly related to the waves, but they are environmental impacts of, of the waves themselves. Um, oh, the one I wanted to show, I don't know if I can show a movie of this, but the, is the this, this effect of the, the wave transport on the sargassum. So this is the process um, called Stokes drift, by which this is a current induced by the waves at the surface. So can you see that? This is just Wikipedia, so if you can't see, you can go and click on the link later. But the idea is it, it's showing that the, the orbital waves, the orbital motion of the waves can induce a, a surface current with it. So even though the particle of water is, is just going round and round, if it's trapped at the surface, you'll actually get a net transport in the direction of the waves. And this is how the sargassum is moving around. So a lot of our a lot of previous modeling is focused on just where the surface currents go in themselves and that's controlled by the, by the gravity, by the rotation um, and, and the background, background sort of ocean physics tides and so on. But if you don't include the wave component in that, you're going to get your transport wrong. So things like the particle tracking, the larval dispersion, um, marine plastic. So all of these things that reply, re rely on you knowing what the surface currents are to see where stuff goes 
they're also going to be affected by getting the waves right because there's this large component of surface velocity that's associated um, and driven by the waves, which has an impact on the, on the sargassum. So how do you get access to this wave data? A lot of this, I mean, all of this, everything I'm showing you today can be downloaded for free. Um, and there's a portal to visualize some of the, the data from CME already published. So the, the AWAC, so this is the instrument that was put out at St. Vincent as part of the project. That's all been shared by the, the BODC, who are the British Ocean Data Center. Um, and that's got two deployments. I've just put the links in here to the talk. So you can, you can get access to that. Um, there, the, a lot of the wave observations, so the, where I had a, a buoy and a model comparison, these were all taken from the National Day Boy Net, National Data Boy Network, so this is the NOAA American um, database, and they've got this set of wave buoys that Judith showed in her previous map, um, which covers this, this set of time period, so you've got sort of 10-15 years of data from most of these sites, and, and here's where they're located. What I have found when looking looking for data is that these are often offshore in deep water, um, where we know our models actually perform quite well because that's it's kind of easier in the way to get the models uh, to work in deep water because there's no confusing factors like coastline or seabed or you know these things getting in the way. So we tend to find that the, the wave and the models are quite good and uh, consistent offshore, but it's only by getting that near shore observations. So the more, more data we can get in the near shore, the better we'll be able to improve our models and try and try and get those two working together. But these are the sites that we've got these public, publicly available data now. Um, the last one is where to get the models. So we've, um, well, I've shown you a couple of different data sets here, but the one that I would, I would recommend if you were starting just, just putting your toe in the water would be to get the era five. So this is, um, it's it's just a huge huge data set and it's kind of a combination of model and observation actually so it's a model which assimilates data to in, improve its quality in these hindcasts so it's called the reanalysis because it's got a bit of everything um, and it's quite high resolution so a third of a degree something like that and hourly data and it's got a long hindcast all the way back from um, 19 yeah 1979 so you can download that for any area you want um, it's all free it's all really well documented. They've got the things that I've shown earlier. So they've got the wave model, the average, the direction, the, the, the period, these peak periods. Um, they've also got the waves partitioned into the spectral. So you can look at those wind sea versus those swell waves. And they've also got the component of the Stokes drift in there as well. So if you're particularly interested in that surface current, you can go away and download those files as well. But these are all, yeah, like I say, these big, big net CDF files. So you just, as long as you know what you're looking for, it's all there. Um, but I just, yeah, I want to just give you an idea of the kind of kind of things and applications that you might want to do with these with these data, and then how to find them. There have also been some wave projections. I didn't really want to go into too much detail on the on these, but there have been climate change projections done for the waves as well. And I, we were part of a um, a global model comparison project where we used climate forced models to see how the waves might change in the future. And again, this has all been published and all the data is available to share. So there's a, there's a link in the um, PowerPoint to this article. And then there's like a scientific data. So the whole thing has been published on, on Nature Scientific Data as well. So having gone through that, um, I just want to launch another quick poll um, before I, I let you take over again. So based on you know, what you've seen today, have. <laughs> Have, has, has it changed your interest in using the wave data? Have you suddenly gone, oh, I've got an idea I could use this, or this is, you know, this is going to be of use to me in some way? I hope so. And I'd be really interested to see, um, you know, again, if you want to write anything in the chat or feedback uh, in our survey at the end of the meeting, if there are sort of particular things that you think would be useful, um, I would be interested to see that as well. Um, I'm also just going to ask a little bit about the sort of formats of the data because I don't know. I think everything, everything that Judith was saying about these the, using the coast to access the data, it does. Yeah, it shows you that some of these models might be really useful, but if they're inaccessible, there's, there's no benefit in doing them if no one's going to use them. So knowing what kind of data you use, how you would format it, um, I would find really helpful. 
So the, the second question I would just be to say is how, um, like what format would you be interested in using this data? So the examples I showed earlier were, were these just these maps, so a nice static picture, some average condition, like a climatology, but then also it could be uh, like a spreadsheet, just a, like a lookup table for your particular climate. Would you be interested in actually downloading the whole thing and having that full data set to play with where you can use that big net CDF file and, and really dig into it yourself? Um, and then the uh, embedded is all part of that question. I'm also asking what sort of variables. So are you interested in, is it just the wave height? Do you not care where they're coming from? Or are you actually interested in the period, the direction, all those, all those details, the difference between these swell waves and the wind sea waves? 